Hello, I'm Bob Denton and welcome to another conversation. You know, many families today are questioning the value of a college education. Fewer high school graduates are going to college and concerns of college access, affordability, debt, and even questioning the perceptions of value as part of the higher education landscape today. But joining me for a conversation on college affordability and return on investment is Dr. Breck Danilovich, president of Radford University and Radford University Provost, Dr. Bethany Usher. And thanks so much for joining the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, Mr. President, that uh, I think without question, I think today one of the toughest, most challenging jobs, especially given the challenges of higher education, is being a president of a college or university today. I'm taking you watch the news and read the paper, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of uh, a lot of events that are occurring out there. Look, when I when I wake up in the morning, uh, I've got a north star, right? Making students successful, getting them educated into their careers. And when you've always got that as a focus, and you've got a great team around you, and you never know what's going to hit your desk, <laughs> that is my ideal job described right there. So for me, I love this opportunity, and I also never hope to end up in a headline for the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> um, I'm first generation mm -hmm. in the college. Uh, very few of my cousins even went um, to college. It was very important for mom and dad for us to um, do well in school, focus on education, go to college, because sure. for them, that was the path to do better and for the American dream. I was very fortunate that I got into my dream university, which was Wake Forest. It was a Baptist uh, college at the time. I was raised Southern Baptist. And about the third night at dinner, before we started, Mom said, now son, you know we love you, but if we sold the house and our car, we couldn't pay the tuition for even two years. Well. They didn't realize at the time, and I said, well, that's okay, I'll go too, and I'm not gonna tell you where I said I'd go to. But, you know, <laughs> okay. but because Wake Forest has a need-blind acceptance policy, I was fortunate and ended up getting a four-year free ride at Wake Forest University. And clearly, I tell that from the standpoint that clearly that it provided a pathway for me to have a very wonderful life, and absolutely from my standpoint, enjoying part of the American dream. And so that notion of college education and what it can do, it seems to be a little bit in jeopardy today. Um, the Gallup poll shows American confidence in higher education has fallen to an all-time low. Just 36% of Americans think highly um, or have quite a lot of confidence in higher education. That's down from 48% in 2018. And so it's bothersome in a way to see that kind of perception of higher ed today. Mm -hmm. Sure. Agreed. Yeah, and, and I think what's happened, at least in, in recent times, is there's been kind of developing narratives about unaffordability of higher education, that it doesn't lead to, to careers, and you can add other narratives in that. What I can say is that many of those narratives are incorrect especially when it comes to, I'm gonna say, regional state universities. You know, and a lot of the times what you will see is challenges around the more elite private institutions or the kind of, we'll just say, large publics. But when it comes to regional state, it is affordable. We lead to careers. We do a lot of other things that are always in line with that tra classic view. So part of this is for universities to be kind of proactive in getting the word out to counter the narrative that has become really pervasive through the news. And we're going to talk about affordability in just a, a couple of minutes or so. One thing that stood out in this Gallup survey, which is a little bit problematic before we get to the numbers, but uh, those age 18 to 34, only 42% at that, which is a target audience, mm -hmm. had a lot of confidence in terms of higher ed. And it is a shame because we know that there's real value in being able to go to college. I, I like you, came from a family where my, my, my grandparents coming out of World War II didn't go to college. My, my dad got a college degree and that led to me being able to get a college degree. And when we look at the numbers in Virginia, we see that you know since 1970, now we, we're, when, when less than 25% of the population had any college education, we look now and see that over 50% of the adults in Virginia have a college education and that's been directly related to the 
the economic prosperity of the of the state that puts us to be an excellent location for for people to live and for um, and for people to be able to um, have a have a good business. Um, and we also know that college education is enriches communities, right? People who have college educations are, live longer. There's a six year age difference in lifespan by people who have a college education versus who do not. We know that they're much more likely to vote. Um, so so we are looking at, at differences of 20, 30% um, just in terms of community engagement in those areas. And we know that people who have college degrees make more money over their lifetime. And that's a compounding benefit both to the, to the students themselves and to the communities they live in. And so I think it's really important, and it does, it changes lives to be able, I mean, I've watched over my whole career watching students' lives change, not only their lives, but then their kids, you know, and we know their grandkids, right, from, from, the, from the benefits of having a college education. You know, one of the things that probably in the last three years I hear about is this notion of there's just simply fewer 18 to 24 year olds, just, just a fact and they're calling it in terms of an enrollment cliff. But what is also, comment on that, but to follow up a little bit, that there are less females and males of that cadre that are going to college. So for example, um, women have declined from 52 to 48 percent. Today only 39 percent of young men, high school graduates, go to college. So there's actually a delta in, 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 in less young men going to college. How real is pending in terms of that enrollment cliff? Uh, part of this depends on the part of the country that you're in, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The Northeast, for example, is declining in its number of high school graduates at a faster pace than anywhere else in, in the nation. Virginia will hit what is termed this enrollment cliff mm -hmm. in the fall of 2025. But in Virginia, just for an example, the number of students graduating from high school is going to be declining about a percent a year. Mm. I don't view that as much of a <laughs> cliff. Okay, that's my no, that's my perspective, but I'm not scared <laughs> of heights. Okay, so, so for me this works out. The th one of the things though that that statistic is so wrapped up in the assumption that it is only graduating high school students that go to university. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, just as an example from Bradford, our number of people that are 22 years or older that are starting university for the first time is accelerating. It is uh. far more than making up for that percent decline in number of high school students. So the enrollment cliff, as people say it, it is about traditionally aged students going to high school and higher ed is shifting, right? We are there to educate people really over their whole lives. What time they intersect with the university, that's just shifting. So I don't view it as an enrollment cliff, I just view it as a shift of who we serve at universities. Mm -hmm. You know, I found uh, the Pew Center for Research. Um, they asked people who, young people who did not decide to go to college, why didn't you go? And a couple of things that from that survey that that's gets to some of the notions of affordability and access. 39% um, said they couldn't afford it. 39%, number one. The second highest percent said need to help support the family. That was 35%. That surprised me a little bit. Um, but you put those two numbers together, whether I can't afford it, but I need to work to support my family. I thought that was rather telling and surprising. Yeah, and, and I would agree with you that that's a concern of, you know, let's say that's 75% of the students now, right, that have one of those two, two perspectives. The, the reality is if you look at if it's affordable or not, and let's say you were thinking about Wake Forest and your family was saying, that's really unaffordable. I don't know where the nearest regional state university to you was, mm -hmm. but I bet you that was a whole lot more affordable than Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. So I think often when people are considering affordability, they are thinking about the Ivy Leagues or the very large public institutions, kind of the traditional flagships. Those can be very expensive, but it, you know, the, the reverse to that is, for a student that stays and goes to community college, gets a fine degree, an excellent high quality degree in fact, they often don't pay anything to go there because it's covered by grants. And then if they're commuting to their local university, there's no cost of a room and board. Mm -hmm. And suddenly that's half the expense of going to university. So suddenly we're chipping away at the kind of narrative around affordability. It makes a big difference. And in that second part that they have to, to kind of work to support their family, 
again, part of that is when individuals go to community colleges or even commute to their local uh, university, they're much more likely to be employed and continue to help support their families than if they go to a distant university. You know, one final statistic in that regard that I thought was interesting, when it said, I don't think I could get into a four-year institution, mm -hmm. it was only 13%. So, so the, the notion that I wouldn't be able to go or to be accepted somewhere just doesn't show in terms of that survey. I thought that was fascinating. And that's is a role of a regional public university. One of our goals is to be able to have access. Students who've completed their, their high school degree and you know have the criteria, we want them to be able to go to, to college. And I'm glad that's making a difference that they're seeing that. Well, we'll tease out a little bit about affordability again, but the other big thing there is and I do think this is real, is, is the notion of college debt. Mm. Um, tuitions, of course, increasing 10% each decade over the last two decades. Um, the debt average for students is thirty-five dollars to $40,000. Sure. Um, I must say um, I've had the privilege of three gubernatorial appointments for Board of Visitors of um, institutions in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I have to say that what was sobering, because I was going there and said, oh, okay, this two, you know, we're going to get yeah. in there and look at this stuff. My goodness, in terms of the fees, in terms of increases in terms of mental health, security, safety, food costs, heating costs, in other words, you start looking at, so it is a very expensive proposition itself. Of course, administrations, as I know you've struggled with, is responsible for trying to keep the ship lean, but it is a, 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 a large pie to have to deal with and expense. Yeah, and, and as you kind of went through that, Bob, you identified several things that are increasing at a greater cost than inflationary rates. Yeah. I think most people accept that, you know, tuition fees, et cetera, will increase at the rate of inflation, but why is it going beyond that? And just, uh, you mentioned yourself, security wasn't really a thing back in the 80s or even the 90s, right? Settings on campuses have changed and there's an expectation now for more investment, more security by universities. Of course we do that, but where does that cost go? Mm -hmm. And that other big concern is mental health, right? That is uh, a, a phenomenon that is growing and that was never a responsibility of a university previously, right? Mm -hmm. We had health centers for quick fixes, but men mental health issues are not quick fixes. Universities were never built for long-term care, yet we are learning how to do that, but that's an increased cost. And at the same time, I will say nationally, just um, through time, states have been slowly um, disinvesting in higher education, well, that, Somebody has to pay for that, right? Somebody has to. So it's going to go on tuition, you know, fees or other costs. So as states slowly disinvest, the, what will happen is the rates of those increases will exceed inflationary increases. So I understand what people are seeing, but it's also, it is a complex melange that creates that situation. You know, when we think about the sources of how to make it affordable, and to have access in terms of, of funding. We start with the family contribution, mm -hmm. maybe institutional, perhaps some scholarships, student work contributions and what have you, because even though in my scholarship, it is still expected me to work in the summer and what have you and that, yep. and then loans. I think there's a thing called unnet me need is what's critical in yep. terms of that. Define what that is and the challenge and what does that mean in terms of the unmet need that most students are confronted sure. with? Sure, so, so for unmet need, basically there's two types of costs at a university. One of those is tuition and fees and room and board, okay? If you're gonna stay on campus, that's the cost. But then there's total need, which also includes things like transportation and um, I'm gonna say personal costs. If your friend has a birthday party and wanna buy them a gift, that has to come from somewhere, okay? It's not gonna come out of tuition. So when we add that, there's another layer of cost that is built in, which is averaged for, for, all, uh, for students. So we've got that total cost, we've got the cost, or sorry, the, the benefit of a student receiving financial aid. As you said, what are the scholarships, Pell Grants, state awards that they've received, the difference between the funds that they are, are given through those awards and the total cost is what is the unmet need. And so there's really two types of families there, just broadly speaking. There's families that 
have wealth through time um, or, or make sufficient money now, they're actually able to cover their children's need. That's one circumstance that happens. And, and the other kind of extreme, there's individuals whose families really can't contribute anything for that. And that's where we've got a scenario where the student will need to potentially work more or take out loans to cover that difference for unmet need. And I think, again, the concern is as university costs somewhat escalate, right, that that unmet need year over year appears to be getting bigger. And I think that's where the biggest concern is for people. And of course, the larger the unmet need, perhaps more loans and if they have to work while going to school, in other words, that impact perhaps progress toward degree and completion. So that is a really critical thing. Well, yes. so um, how do you handle this? And especially in terms of your consideration programmatically in terms of Radford, how are you addressing the opportunity in this regard? So, so Bob, I'm gonna approach it just on bulk first, because okay, I just wanna please. break down how the costs mm -hmm. go. So Radford, total cost, remember, kind of all in, including the birthday gifts for friends, right? <laughs> just kind of all in. The, the, the price that you would see online is $30,000 a year, which again, looks like a big price because you've got to attend for four years, right? Then when you start looking at how aid works, if you're a fa from a family that makes, uh, you know, we'll, we'll say less than $90,000 a year, depending on your family composition, you may be eligible for Pell, which covers up to $7,300 of that total. Mm -hmm then in our state, the average student gets a state aid of about $6,000. Well, we're up to a little over $13,000, right, being covered. And for students that are able to work, if you work $15, or 15 hours a week during the year, which can be shown it's not gonna have an academic impact on you, 30 hours a week over the summer, even after paying social security, taxes, and everything else, you're gonna <coughs> net about $12,000 a year as a student. So I'm already up to $25,000 out of 30, okay? Mm -hmm. See, you, you can start seeing college really isn't unaffordable. It depends on where you go. And I'm gonna say also, we are working really hard with our community colleges to encourage people to use that community college pipeline because then, not only are they starting in their first two years, doesn't have a lot of cost, coming to Radford, I'm gonna knock off $12,500 of that bill that I talked about, right, which is room and board. Mm -hmm. So our starting place is actually closer to $17,000 for students. Well, then when you have the Pell and the state aid, part-time summertime job and you're breaking even without loans, without parents, without debt. So there's great misunderstanding about affordability Mm -hmm. if you work with your local university and community colleges. So, in, in, and one of the things we've done is, again, trying to dispel the rumor that college is not affordable is important, right? Yeah. So one of the things that we did this past year is we decided institutionally to invest in a program called Radford Tuition Promise, and uh, students from a family where they make $100,000 or less, their tuition will be covered at Radford University. Okay, in other words, they don't have to worry about how they're gonna cover tuition between the grants that they receive or institutional support, tuition's covered. So that's a big component of attending university and they can already check that one off, that I don't have to worry about that. It starts dispelling the rumor that universities are unaffordable. There's so many positives that come about attending, we need to be very proactive and that's part of our commitment to try to indicate to people and families how affordable higher education can be. And so in this um, new program, Radford Tuition Promise, um, what is not covered? I mean, in other words, you, you mentioned what's covered, what is not covered, what do you think? So if, if a student comes, what the commitment is, no matter what, right, from these families, we've got tuition covered. Now, for those students, we may also be covering fees. We may also be covering books, but that depends on the family. The minimum is tuitions covered, okay? So if you kind of reverse that, what a student may have to pay for are things like books for fees. And if they're staying on campus, there's room and board. We don't commit to cover those things, but many students do have parts of that or a lot of it covered by additional aid that they've received. So all we're trying to project is that, you know, for, for, for students, here is a very affordable route because remember, if students commute, 
to go to New River Community College, right? Virginia Western Community College, wonderful institutions in our area. They get their two-year degree. They're basically graduating without debt and, and having gotten their, their degree supported on their way through. They come to Radford, they don't have to worry about tuition. There's no room and board. What's left is fees and books. The cost per year is about $5,000 for a student. So over that two years, that's $10,000. Again, a part-time job in the summer covers it. I haven't mentioned loans, mm -hmm. haven't mentioned parents, haven't mentioned debt. Wow. That's the type of narrative that we need to be getting out and promoting. And that's huge things. because it is the debt, when I gave the earlier figure, 30 to 40,000 average mm -hmm. nationwide. Um, that's incredible. Now, will continuing and current students be able to participate? I mean, in the implementation of this? A absolutely, it's for all of our undergraduate students from the Commonwealth who are taking in-person degrees. All right, those are our caveats, <laughs> okay? But with that, it's for our continuing students, it's for transfer students, it's for new students, and what we do is like any program, for our new students, we commit for that until they graduate, right? That's our commitment. But we always have to look to make sure it makes financial sense, but it, it, it makes sense for us as an institution. And I'll tell you, the goodwill that that has built, while we've had to in, uh, invest institutionally, it's also really helped get the word out about Radford <laughs> University. So rather than spend on marketing dollars, we spend on supportive students and everybody wins. Well, and, and so um, out-of-state students are not part of this? They are not. Um, transfer students, yes, you said they are eligible. Yep. And you can be eligible for it for all four years. That's correct. <clears throat> if I come as a freshman and for some reason I get washed out, I don't go further, is there any payback kind of requirements? Let's say that I get this yeah. and for some reason I get to my junior year and I either transfer out or something happens. Just curious about yep. that on that end. Yep, there's no, no payback required. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a payback is if a student has taken out loans, right. and that's that's oh, you know right. generally from a company or you know the the, the uh, a government agency. So for us, there's no payback. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and um, we have um, three minutes or so remaining. Um, what would you add in terms of the broader? So there seems to be some misunderstanding about affordability. In your particular case, you've addressed the other big concern is about debt. It doesn't seem to be necessarily a shortage of that attendance wall. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of the other challenges as you look forward and thinking about? So, I think really the idea of making sure that students and communities understand the value of a public regional university. That we want to make sure that students understand that you know we're committed to students are thriving. That our then that our communities are thriving. That we are engaged in the community, um, and that so the value of the of the education is both the value of the education for for the student and also for the value that we give to the communities that we're in. So making sure people understand that. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of like uh, as Bethany said about uh, adding value to communities. Like um, public universities in particular have a responsibility to their communities. Part of that is economic development, right? So we're working closely with with our regional businesses, which includes nonprofits and other organizations, to provide internships, apprenticeships for our students, because then our students themselves are also adding value back mm -hmm. into the community. So it's a way to say we're not just an educational institute, we're an institute that supports learning and our communities. And in a sense, that's what a public institution should be doing. Mm -hmm. And are you there used to be or still some criticism. I mean, so for example, the corporations now who are reevaluating the need for a degree to yeah. do certain jobs, mm -hmm. pressure there. Um, there's some criticism which I think is valid with some institutions, not talking about Radford. <laughs> sure. Um, where looking at where the demand is and not following it quite as much and still trying to make sure that they have a full-fledged quote maybe philosophy department or some of these niche classes as a continually reviewing so that it can add in terms of economic development mm -hmm. have some programs that have market value it seems like that's a continual process yeah. i'm not sure that a lot of uh, universities are 
doing the best job in that, in my humble opinion. Well, I will, I will tell you two things about what we know about that. One is that we know that every student who graduates with a college degree, no matter what their major is, winds up getting a premium over their lifetime because of that degree. Um, and so that's a really important point. The other point is places like Radford are really, um, in, you know, we, we embed kind of work-ready skills directly into the curriculum so that students who are anywhere from a philosophy to a nursing major are coming out, those on-campus jobs, the kind of work that they're doing by doing internships or undergraduate research, we actually measure them against the work-ready skills to make sure that our students are coming out ready to be able to be in the workplace, and not just for their first job, but for all the jobs they're gonna have in their lifetime. Madam Provost, you're very persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> I like the sound of that. Um, and as, as, as uh, one who has a daughter-in-law who majored in philosophy, she's now uh, working with the Rand Corporation mm -hmm. and doing extremely well. Right. And I can't make jokes about philosophy majors in our, our family gets <laughs> anymore. Um, we literally have about a minute and a half. What would be your final thoughts that you would share on this broad particular topic? Uh, it goes back to that original return on investment, right? Is going to a university worth it? And, and I'm gonna say not only you know, for the points that, that Bethany has stated, you know, there's earnings, there's happiness, there's health, there's multi-generational benefits from attending, but ultimately you are learning a suite of life skills mm -hmm. that are associated with, again, it's career, mm -hmm. but it's also how you support your community more effectively. So it's career, and it's community. I mean, that's what we're here for. And it's, again, that's kind of our North Star that we work on and wake up to every day, gets us excited to work with our colleagues and motivates us as, as an institution. And um, to me, there's been no better time to go in and attend higher education in the United States. Well said, and I have to tell you, we're all the time we have, very informative and enlightening. And I wanna thank you so much for joining the conversation. Oh, thank you for having us. And as always, I wanna thank you for joining us. And I hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.